Greetings everyone, um, my name's Aidan. Greetings everyone, my name's Aidan Hart and uh, I'm an icon painter and, and writer. And uh, I'm speaking at the moment actually from St. Catherine's in Mount uh, Sinai. Um, I was quite surprised when I came that we can have all these uh, uh, modern gadgets here so this uh, talk can be recorded. Um, I gave a, a, a talk to uh, my group um, two days ago, um, and someone wanted to record it, Liz Edmonds wanted to record it, but it didn't work pretty well. So I'm going to be doing a sort of repetition of that, but it will still be ad lib and hopefully uh, lively. And the subject of what I wanted to talk about was uh, the beauty of liturgical art. Uh, liturgical art in this context just means uh, worship. So not just the singing, but the architecture, portable icons, furnishings, the way light's used, and so on. This photograph you see is actually the Basilica, the main church of uh, the um, Monastery of St. Catherine's in Sinai. So you can see how beautiful that is. So I want to talk about, about beauty, and particularly beauty and worship. And as you can see, the um, subtitle here is Beauty, Luxury, or Necessity. I was reading the... Um, the uh, Bill of Human Rights, as one does for relaxation one day. And it struck me that among all the things listed as rights, not that I'm particularly happy with that term right, um, but nothing was mentioned about beauty there. And it's interesting that in the 60s and 70s in Britain, uh, a lot of pretty ugly high rise apartments were built. Um, and they found that after a few decades, the unhappiness that was produced by living in this ugliness, this concrete jungle, produced so many social problems and so much misery, it was actually cheaper to pull the whole lot down and build things of greater beauty because they found that beauty raises the soul, ugliness suppresses the soul and can, um, it's a form of violation of the human person. So given that Christians um, can create their own environment in worship, it struck me once that if Christians are going to help in the world at all, we've got to start with our own living room, as it were, start with our own house, which is how we worship. Uh, There's a wonderful vision that the prophet Ezekiel had of the temple. And he saw that from under the uh, altar of the temple, under the threshold of the temple, came a river, and wherever that river went, it brought life. So to me, worship is, is like the temple and a river comes out of that and wherever it goes, it brings life. So we experience divine beauty in worship. Then we, after the service is finished, we go into the world and we can begin to bring a bit of beauty into the world. If you're an architect, a teacher, whatever. If we've experienced beauty, divine beauty, the coming together of creator and creation in a wonderful way, in a glorious way in worship, we're more likely then to see and treat people and the world and stones and rocks and trees in a different different way. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this and talking now, not very far from the burning bush that Moses saw. And what's interesting is that his life changed from a way of seeing. Once he saw differently, he acted differently. He saw this bush burning with a flame, yet the flame didn't consume the bush. So this fire was obviously divine fire. He beheld God expressing himself, as it were, through creation. So we can consider the beauty of liturgical art as a burning bush. We have matter. This photograph here shows us um, stone, granite. Those columns are made of granite. Um, brass for the lamps and so on. Just stuff, hard, solid stuff. But it becomes a burning bush. It becomes a revelation of divine glory. So that's the theme I want to talk about. Um, in this picture here, we see um, two um, walls. Uh, this is actually Catholic Church in Leeds. And the, um, the priest there, uh, Father Michael, unfortunately uh, died. But, um, he's praying for us in heaven, I'm sure. He inherited this church. And the first thing he did was to commission to replace the white wall. Um, there have been some people who said that um, white walls are better because they won't distract us from Christ. But in fact, this is a form of heresy, really. Um, we're made for beauty. And it's interesting, after I had uh, done this fresco of the Transfiguration, I went back to the parish uh, not long after, about a month after, and spoke with some of the parishioners. And they said it's transformed our worship. 
because now we see the face of Christ. Before it was just a white wall. Now we behold color. We behold the transfiguration of Christ. We behold the disciples beholding the face of the Lord. So this was evidence to me that the right sort of beauty, not just not baroque beauty or sentimental beauty, the right sort of beauty can indeed be a gateway um, to Christ. So um, before I, I go on to um, talk about three aspects of divine beauty, which I will call the priestly role of the human person and the royal role of the human person and the prophetical role, I want to give just a little summary of the theology of the icon of the image. Um, so I could say that the um, icon, the uh, image of Christ, images of saints, um, affirm three things. Firstly, incarnation. The photograph you see here is of the um, chapel I, I made in the Heretic. I lived as a hermit for about six, seven years in the hills of Shropshire, and I converted um, half a barn into this chapel. So on the right, you can see an image of Christ. So this image is of God made man. God become flesh, God become visible. So when um, in the 8th and 9th centuries, for about 120 years, there was a heresy called iconoclasm, which means icon smashing, um, the church had to think about, well, are icons good? And if they are good, why? And the main conclusion they came up with was that an icon of Christ affirms that God has indeed become human. God has taken on our matter and our material body. So we can depict them. We can depict the man, Jesus Christ, who walked upon earth. Secondly, the icon affirms the communion of the saints. We have icons, as you see in this chapel here, not only of Christ, but of the mother of God. Here we have Sarah from the south off on the left, a Russian saint, St. Anthony of Egypt, St. George. So when you walk into a chapel like this, which is completely frescoed, so you're completely surrounded by saints, you realize that coming to Christ is coming to the whole city of Christ. We can't come just to Christ and say, I don't want your, your sons and your daughters, your brothers and sisters, just want you. Christ says, no, you've got to take the whole lot of us, either me um, and all of us or nothing at all. Which is why, of course, we're baptized into the church. Someone else must put their hands on us and baptize us. We're baptized into the communion of the saints, not only into Christ. And thirdly, icons, not just panel icons, but frescoes, carved icons, affirm the goodness of matter. And I love this. I love working with matter. I, I carve stone and wood and um, paint with um, lime and water and, and pigment and egg tempera. I just love matter because matter can be a form of me expressing my love for God and God comes to me through transform matter. In fact, I came to believe in the existence of God through trees. I was raised in New Zealand and spent a lot of my childhood on trees, making tree huts, hiding in trees. So um, for me, matter, in this case trees, was my forerunner, like John the Forerunner prepared the way for Christ, or God's material universe prepared um, my discovery, if you like, my meeting of God. Um, so that, that's the basic, the theological basis of, of icons. Now, sometimes when people go to an Orthodox church, I'm a member of the Orthodox church, they see people kissing icons and they can get a bit uh, upset about this. I think, why are they kissing icons? Are they idol worshippers? The answer to this are these wonderful words of St. John of Damascus. He was one of the church fathers who defended imagery um, against the iconoclasts. And um, they thought it was bad not only to have icons, but if you have them, to kiss them, to venerate them. So St. John of Damascus says that the two types of worship, he says, I do not worship matter, I worship the God of matter, I only worship God alone. But this God became matter for my sake and deigned to inhabit matter, and he worked out my salvation through matter. I will not cease, therefore, from honouring that matter which works for my salvation. I venerate it, though not as God. So in summary, he says, I worship God alone, but I venerate all people and things through which God comes to me. So when we greet a person, we're greeting them as living images of Christ. We don't worship them, we say, oh, God has come to us, but God has come to us through that person. So this balance of worshiping God alone, but venerating all things through which God comes to us, be that as an animate matter, like an icon or a person, um, it's a really important distinction. 
uh, this uh, wonderful mosaic I just literally saw it a few minutes ago um, is uh, in the apse of the Church of St. Catherine's in the Monastery of St. Catherine's. It shows the Transfiguration. I show this because I'm going to refer the, to the Transfiguration a lot. It tells us basically everything we need to know about the faith. Um, in the Orthodox Church, the imagery is very strongly related uh, to the hymnography, word and image go hand in hand. And we have this wonderful hymn here, uh, sung in small vespers for the Feast of Transfiguration. And it says, today Christ on Tabor has changed the dark nature of Adam and filling it with brightness, he has made it godlike. So the heart of liturgical art um, in the Orthodox Church are these two things, deification and communi communion. Deification means becoming um, radiant with God's presence. So in this hymn here, it says, Christ has changed the dark nature of Adam and he's filled it with brightness and he's made it godlike. So that when Christ was transfigured, he wasn't only showing us that he was God, but he was showing us how he intended us as humans to become, which is not just merely human, but humans who bear God. And this is why we depict icon, we depict saints with halos, because they're not just human, but the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, dwells in them and shines out through them. So Christ's transfiguration showed us what it is to be truly human, which is not to be merely human, but to be a, a man, a woman, made God by grace. St. Peter, and this is a radical thing to say, that God became man, so man by grace can become God with a small g. Now St. Peter says the very same thing. He says that God has given us many promises, that by these we may become participators in the divine nature. Participators in the divine nature. Not just beholders of God, not just followers at a distance, but to participate in God's glory, God's light. So this is the basis, I think, of, of, of high liturgical art, that it shouldn't just show the world as seen with our spiritual eyes as well, see the world transfigured. We see the world there not just as a bush, but as a bush burning. So in fact, what may have happened when Moses saw the bush burning without being consumed, it wasn't so much that the bush suddenly caused the light and he saw it, but the bush had always been burning with God's power and grace and light, but Moses' eyes were opened by God to see the bush as it always was. And the second thing that uh, gives the particular beauty of liturgical art is communion. We will see that um, the icon tradition doesn't want us to stop it itself. The icon doesn't say, look at me, I'm a wonderful reproduction of something that happened 2,000 years ago. The icon exists, the art exists. It's like, this is, this is us looking here, this is the icon here. The icon doesn't just stop here and say, look at me, I'm wonderful, aren't I? It says, I'm a door, go through me to find Christ or the saint or the angel on the other side. So the a true beauty doesn't say, look at me, it says, look through me to the source of beauty. Look at beauty, small b, to discover beauty, capital B. So just to reiterate what I said, that God's birth made our deification, our theosis, the church fathers call it, a possibility. So here we have an icon I painted of the nativity, which is God becoming man. And on the right, we have Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the disciples and filled them with light. This icon on the right is here, St. Catherine's, and you can see quite clearly the halos around them to show that they not only just look at God as light, as uh, Peter, James, and John did in the previous um, icon of uh, the Transfiguration here. Here, they're just looking at the light. But here, the same people perceive the light. So as Athanasius the Great said, God became man, so man might become God by grace. So liturgical art, icons, or whatever, should not only show us, however, the end, which is to be radiant, to be full of light, but also it should show us the struggle required to get there. That's a natural thing to live supernaturally. That's a natural thing to be a God-bearer, a Christ-bearer. Because of our sin and our past mistakes, 
we're all addicts, really. We all suffer from some passions. We all suffer from some bad habits. Um, so a certain struggle is needed to um, undo the bad things we've done to ourselves. Uh, and this requires um, effort. So on the left here is an icon again at the monastery here called the Ladder of Divine Ascent. It was a great saint, St. John of the Ladder. In fact, my friends that I, I went to visit the cave where he lived last uh, yesterday, he lived as a hermit for 20, 40 years. I don't know which in this cave and then became the abbot here and wrote a book called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. And this icon here shows monks going up the ladder. Christ is at the very top. And you can see some of them have been pulled down by demons, but some make it to the top. So if it's required to go up the ladder, the angels at the top are praying for them. The monks at the bottom are praying for them. So we've got all the help you need, but we can still make a choice. Yes, God, or no God. And on the right, you see an icon of the Transfiguration I paid, painted a few years ago. You can see on the left, Christ taking Peter, James, and John up the hill, a bit of effort there. I'd like to stay at the top to have a, an eternal party, as it were. Remember, Peter says, let's build three tents and let's stay here. Um, but Christ said, no, we've got to go back down. So you can see on the right, Christ is getting down into the world. And of course, later, Christ gets crucified. He gets tortured, if you like, and crucified. He's suffering there, but then he rises from the dead. So to reach Pentecost, the disciples, Christ has got to go through terrible um, hardship and struggle. So icons, true beauty, should have this what we call bright sadness in orthodoxy. Amulipi is one word in Greek, but it combines two words, sort of bright sadness. There's struggle, but there's joy mixed together. So icons should not just help us in our personal relationship with God and the saint, but also help us to see the world differently. As I mentioned earlier, everything in an icon, rocks, trees, stones, are painted in an unusual way to try to give us a hint um, of, of this fire within. The writer to the, um, uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament said that he upholds all things by the word of his power. So when God created something, he spoke a word, let's say oak tree or stone, but that word that God spoke remains in that thing and keeps it in existence uh, and directs it towards, as it were, the new Jerusalem. The whole world is actually on a journey. The whole world is, whole cosmos is a ship moving towards the second coming of Christ. So as we get closer to Christ, we begin to see everything as a gift of God. We, we see everything with a little label on it, from Christ with love. So instead of just being a hunk of batter, no matter how beautiful, it's an expression of love. It's, it's, it's burning, um, as it were, a flame with, with God's love. So wherever we look, we, we see love. We see divine love expressed to us. So, for example, this affects the style of icons, if you like. This, this vision of the world doesn't just um, affect what is painted, but also how it's painted. So, for example, we don't have this technique called chiaroscuro, which is created by strong light on one side and shadow on the other. Why? Because, as we see in this icon here, the Virgin and Christ, she's radiant with light and she's bathed in light. So then we have enough modeling to show she's a real person, uh, She's three dimensional, if you like. You know, she's got a body. She's not a cardboard cutout. She's not just a transparent spirit. Nonetheless, you don't get dark on one side, light on the other, because they're radiant with light. They, they are the source of light, if you like. So let's now pass to the three roles of us as individual human beings, but us and the community of, of the body of Christ and the church. We can summarize these three roles and we'll see this relationship with beauty in a second, as prophet, priest, and ruler, or king. Um, I'll read out for you these wonderful words of St. Gregor of Nazianzus, a fourth century saint. He said, this man or this person, this human person whom God created, he sit upon earth as a kind of second world, a microcosm, a small world, as another kind of angel, a worshiper, of blended nature, that is, he's got, he's not just like an angel, spirit, spirit and flesh together of blended nature. Thus, he is a living creature under God's providence here, 
while in transition to another state. And this is the consummation of the mystery in process of deification by reason of his natural tendency toward God. So we're made of flesh and spirit, um, but we're living sort of between the two worlds. There's the rest of the material world here and God above, and we're the overlapping point. We participate in rocks and trees and all these things that don't have a spiritual nature as we have, um, but also we have the breath of God in us, so we're, we're linked to God, and we're, we're, we're where the two worlds overlap, and that's where our role as prophet, priest, and ruler come in, as we'll see in a minute. So the Bible begins, interesting, with the garden and ends with the New Jerusalem. If you read the last book of the Bible, it talks about the heavenly New Jerusalem coming down from heaven. So these are two illuminated manuscripts they did many years ago. On the left is Adam and Eve in paradise. And on the right, so that's the beginning of the Bible, and on the right is the New Jerusalem, a city. Though it is a, a green city, we see at the bottom the river coming out and the uh, trees and flowers. So it's a, it's, a, it's a green city, a very ecological city. So we begin with something that's pure, but not yet perfect. We're on a, a journey toward the New Jerusalem. And it's not this we've got to wait around and God does everything and then eventually he comes down with everything finished. We are, as it were, by our love, by our deeds, by our um, kindness shown to people, we are um, helping to build, if you like, that New Jerusalem. So let's look at the first role, which is um, the church, or us also individuals, as a prophet poet. Uh, one way of understanding the role of a prophet is to call them a poet. Um, in um, the book of Hebrews, as I said, God creates and sustains each thing with the word. So we, like prophets, might discern these hidden words of love spoken by the bridegroom to us. So when God created that thing, he hid his word inside, and our job is to uncover that word. So on the right here, we have this wonderful um, mosaic in Sicily, in Podomo, and Christ is creating each thing with the word. What does he do then? Adam, in, once he's created, he names things, he gives them names. He's a great saint of Russia called Sarah from Salof, and he said that when Adam named the animals, they weren't just arbitrary names, sort of what popped into his head, but they express the essence, the logos, of the thing he was naming. We find in the Old Testament, people's names are very important. They end up being prophetic. It's also in the New Testament, sometimes where people's names were changed. Um, Saul to Paul. Um, Christ gives the name Peter um, to Peter. He's a rock. Instead of Simon, he's Peter, he becomes a rock. So we tend to think, perhaps I did anyway in the old days, as a prophet, as someone who speaks speaks the word of God. Well, he certainly does that, or she does that. Um, first of all, the prophet's got to listen, got to, got to hear the word of God, and then he then have they got the right to speak. So our first role as a human being is to be contemplators and listeners. That's why in icons, you tend to have larger eyes, longer noses, and if the ears are exposed, slightly larger ears. Because the first thing we are to do is just behold what God has already done. Perhaps we hear words too often and we forget the real meaning. The word the gospel means good news. And what's news? It tells us something that's already happened. You can't have news about something that's going to happen. So the gospel is telling us what Christ has already done. So all we can do is just believe it and look at it and enjoy it. Of course, that will then affect what we do. It's not a passive thing. But before we start acting and running around and trying to help people, we first start to behold what God has done, and then we act in a different way. St. Paul said, I labor more than all the apostles, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. To get here to Mount Sinai, I was in a plane most of the time, and then in a car. So I was just sitting, basically doing nothing, but I was moving. So I think the great saints of the church often wasted a lot of time um, doing nothing, in inverted commas, apart from praying, repenting, and sort of getting all the garbage after them. And then it might be one year in their life, might be 10, doesn't really matter. God speaks through them. In that short time, much more is done than if they're just running around like a, in a, in a fit trying to sort of do everything in their own strength. So 
St. John Climacus, for example, he was 20, 40 years his disagreement how long. He lived wasting his time in a cave. But in the short time he was abbot, he transformed things and still we're feeding off the words that he, he wrote. So icons are prophetic in the sense that they help tease out and reveal and hint at the hidden meaning of things. So this is, you might call quite a crude icon, um, quite folkish, but it actually reveals a lot of things. Um, so an icon reveals the logos, the hidden word of things. So for example, Mary is a bit larger than the other figures and she's slightly diagonal to show that through Christ becoming man in her, um, Christ unites heaven and earth, so she's partly vertical. Also, she's partly horizontal to show that angels and humans are united. You get angels from the top left-hand corner and the magi at the right. So um, angels and, and humans are united. Also, you get often you get shepherds from one side, the magi on the other. Now, the shepherds are Jews. They're poor and not very learned. The magi were... Um, non-Jews, um, Gentiles, and they're rich and they were learned, but they come together in Christ. Of course, saints have halos, but um, often icons show inanimate things or trees or birds also in a different way because the icon tries prophetically to reveal the logos within them. So we see in this marvellous Mosaic here from Ravenna. If you haven't been to Ravenna, I, I highly recommend it. Um, this is the church of Polinarian class just outside of Ravenna. And you, you can see around the tree the slight glow, as it were, the tesserae, the little bits of mosaic is slightly more yellow around the tree. It's just so it's got its own little radiance. Someone has said that Christians aren't pantheists because they don't believe that everything is God, but they are panentheists. They believe that God is is in everything. Another thing that um, icons sort of reveal, as it were, prophetically about the world that we can't see with our media physical eyes, is that the backgrounds are either gold or some radiant color like vermilion or reflective white. So this background represents the Holy Spirit who sustains all things. He also dwells within the saints, so hence the halo, but even if it were a sinner, a really sinful person, you'd still have gold behind because God is present and keeps that sinful person in existence. So there are sort of two meanings of gold in an icon. One is to indicate him, Holy Spirit, dwelling in people who want him to dwell in them. But also he's like the water that a, a fish swims in. A fish can't live without water. And the Holy Spirit is like the ocean in which we move as human beings, regardless of whether or not we believe in God. There's this lovely quote here. The person found worthy to dwell in God will perceive the pre-existing in God all the inner essences of creative things. So though things were created in time, the idea of them, if you like, existed eternally in God's mind. So this is what Maximus is confess confessor is saying here, that the, the ideas, if you like, of things created eternally existed eternally in the mind of God, and then he spoke them into existence and time. So it's these logoi of things that we perceive as we get closer to God and which icons indicate exist. So um, that explains briefly our role as prophets to see God in creation and then to live that out, to, 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 to speak and, and to, to act accordingly. The second role is to be a priest. Um, Bishop Callistos, of blessed memory, who died recently, said that one is priest, that's Christ, he alone is priest. Some are priests, they are, they are the ordained people who are priests, and all are priests, all of us need to live as priests. And a priest is someone who mediates between God and the rest of the created world. I talked earlier about the creation of spirit and matter, that's why we link the two worlds together. We have this rather um, remarkable quote from Leontius of Cyprus here, a 6th, 7th um, century saint. He says, the creation does not venerate God directly by itself, but it is through me that the heavens declare the glory of God. Through me, the moon worships God. Through me, the stars glorify him. Through me, the waters and showers and rain, the dew and all creation venerate God and give him glory. 
So though creation can praise God, one of the Psalms, one of the last Psalms of the Psalter says, praise him, sun and moon, praise him, stars and light. But it can't thank God. Well, it can, but through us, we're like the mouthpiece, the priestly mouthpiece of all the creation. So here we have this remarkable mosaic in the Polynesian class. So this actually depicts the transfiguration. You can see Moses and Elijah on the top there. Um, it's a tiny image of Christ in the middle of the cross. And then the three sheep, two, one on the right, one on the left, are Peter, James, and John. And then this marvelous sort of paradisical scene below. Then underneath the cross is the bishop, Apollonardi. And then further down are other bishops, and further down, still not visible, is the actual altar where the Eucharist is celebrated. So this marvelous mosaic shows us that we're created to be priests of the whole of creation, so that when we um, thank God, the whole of creation is thanking God through us. So when we bring the bread and wine and put it in the altar, in that bread and wine, we're offering ourselves, because we made bread and wine, they didn't just drop from heaven, we took wheat, ground it up and baked it, we took grapes, patiently fermented them to make wine. So the bread and the wine is the whole of creation transformed by our craft, and then God himself transforms it into the body and blood of Christ. So we come to the third um, role now. Um, I'll just, actually, I'll just go back. The making of an icon is actually a priestly act as well. We take the three um, elements of creation. Um, the pigment is from the mineral kingdom. The um, wood on which the icon is painted is from the vegetable kingdom. And we mix the pigment with egg, that's the animal kingdom. So these good things like our words in a dictionary or notes in the musical scale are put together by us um, as, as, as priests, if you like, and we make them articulate in the praise of God. So that's another sort of priestly act. You could say it's prophetical as well, declaring the glory of God through paint, but it's got a priestly aspect as well. Our third role is, um, is ruler. Now, this, has, this verse has been abused a lot. Of course, we're living in a terrible ecological crisis, and I believe that the source of our crisis is actually a misinterpretation of these words in Genesis 1.28. Um, it, it's sort of it's been misunderstood as God giving us a divine right to sort of do whatever we want to the world below us. Think of it as a big bank full of money and you can take as much out as you want. There's plenty there. Cut down as many trees as you want. Plenty more left. But this is a really false understanding of, of these um, words. So what do they say? God blessed Adam and Eve and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living thing that moves on the ground. And elsewhere, this puts it in, I think, a, 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 more, a clear context. Having put Adam and Eve, well, first, actually, having planted a, a garden, God plants a garden, he's got this wild world, if you like, that he's created, but he plants a garden, he puts Adam and Eve in, or puts Adam in, and then later Eve, and says, um, fill and multiply, tend the garden, and basically expand that garden and make the whole of this wild world a beautiful garden. In other words, a mingling of our craft, um, with the, the wild energy of, of beautiful creation. So make the good very good. So there, our mastery is not to push everything down, but to raise it up even higher. And that's why in the book of Genesis, it's only after he's created us humans that he says creation is very good. Before that is good, good, good. He makes us, and it's very good, because only through us will the words become a poem, or the notes become a symphony. So our power, our rulership, is there, in a sense, to serve what's below us, to lift it up. So as an icon painter, my job is to serve God above all, to serve the people I'm painting the icon for, but also to humbly serve the azurite or the red oak or the yellow oak or the wood I'm carving to discover the logos within them, their, their particular strengths and weaknesses, and then make them even more beautiful. I was talking a bit earlier about these three different um, elements made in creating an icon. So Christians as ruler artists, 
composing even more beautiful things from God's raw creation. So these raw materials on the left are used to create the icon of our Chinese saints on, on the right. So our authority in the world is given to raise and beautify the world, not to wreck it. The church's rule in the world should be like a person whose spirit directs aright their body and actions so God can transfigure them. And beautiful churches, like the one we have a few feet away from me, exemplify this union of the personal and the material. So really, ecological disaster around us, and just up the road, well, not just up the road, but, but if it is 100 miles away, we've just finished the big international con <clears throat> conference on global warming. And these are important meetings of, on the backward scale, but it all starts in here, in the heart of Aiden Hart. If I make a, a wrong choice and I don't unite my body to my spirit and don't um, live a, according to God, God's intention, then I'm naturally going to start making ecological disasters. Um, so ultimately, our ecological crisis is only going to be solved through repentance, through uh, living as a prophet, priest, and a ruler artist. It all starts inside. So Maximus, I just love St. Maximus, the confessor, if you may have guessed, he said, the spiritual world is in the material world, but the presence of a soul in a body. And the material world is fused with the spiritual, like a body with its soul. As soul and body make one man, so the two make one world. So we can think of the whole of the material cosmos as a body, and that's because we're spiritual beings as humans are the soul of the world. Just as our spirit and our body, the two make one, so the whole cosmos is only understood um, in the context of our priestly role within it. And it all starts in the human heart. This is why monks and nuns waste a lot of time working on their own in a life, not because they're selfish, but because they realize the spring, if it's going to flow out of us and bring life in the world, we've got to unblock that spring. There might be billions of gallons um, under the ground, but if I blocked up that one spring, none of that can get out into the world, and that blockage is my own inner life. I'll just finish a bit. Um, we're talking about really sort of universal things here, but each of us is completely unique. Aiden Hart is a, an endangered species. Um, Liz Edmonds is an endangered species. There's only one Liz Edmonds in the world. If Liz doesn't become Liz, then the world is poorer. If, if John doesn't become John, then we're poorer people. So this um, unique role of each person is expressed in the uniqueness of each icon. And here in front of us, I've just chose sort of at random four different icons of the um, uh, nativity of Christ. So on the left, we've got a seventh century icon. We just saw that a few minutes ago. That's a Coptic one. On the right, we have another a Coptic one, I think, but a bit later. You can see they're, they're different. Here we have an even more different one. This is a Byzantine one, influenced more by early classical models. Um, and then on the right, you have a later one, a bit more fussy. Um, so they're all saying more or less the same thing, but in different, different ways. Here, um, I come from Britain, and I go to this um, Orthodox parish. It's in a church whose foundations are actually from the 7th, 7th 8th century. The building, uh, as it stands, is mostly from the 13th century, and it's in Britain. So when I made this wooden icon screen here, I designed that according to old British medieval techniques, or um, what are called the mortise and tenon joints with wooden pegs in. I used traditional scratch molding, it's called, to make the molding, and I, um, I drew ideas from local carving. And the stone altar you can see there, there are elements um, taken from the local uh, monastery at Winlock Abbey, which uh, was like the, door, the, the mother monastery of our parish many centuries back. And all the stone from um, Bade used to make that altar is local stone. So I've sort of taken local things and tried to express uh, timeless things. And above, I painted this fresco. Um, and this is drawn on uh, local British traditions, um, Romanesque in particular. So you'll find that timeless things then need wisdom to know how to express in our particular epoch and our, our place. So the timeless and uh, uh, 
time come together. So in conclusion then, I would say action in the world follows the vision given by the liturgy. I have a friend um, who's a, a theologian at Durham University and one of his specialties is um, ecology, how to address our ecological um, crisis. Uh, Carmody Gray, her name is. And she says, if you want to find a solution, a starting point for ecological crisis, start with worship. Get your worship right first. In the Transfiguration um, Feast in Matins, we have this wonderful um, hymn. Having uncovered, O Saviour, a little of the light of thy divinity to those who went up with you into the mountain, you made them, the disciples, lovers of your divine glory. So think of the Holy Liturgy. We go up the mountain to go to the Holy Liturgy, to go to church, if you like. We see Christ transfigured, and that changes us. Then we go down the mountain, out into the world, and we act differently because we have experienced the glory of, of light. And this wonderful photograph here, the liturgy being celebrated here at the monastery. You can see the light flooding out, comes out to us, then it actually flows out of the doors as we leave and bring that light into the world. So church art is a paradigm of how we are to live in the larger world. Liturgy in its art forms should express this vision. So this is a chapel that I frescoed for a little church in Evia in Greece. It was commissioned by Denise Sherard, um, in part to express the orthodox teaching that her husband, Philip Sherard, often spoke and wrote about, which is um, basically the spiritual roots of archaeological crisis and how to live properly in the world. So here, um, Denise and I try to express um, a worldview that included the uh, material world. So between the saints, there are trees, um, often there are animals associated with the saints. And it's had a real effect. There's a local teacher, apparently, who brings school children here to sort of show them what a Christian ecology is. So. This little tiny church I made basically with dirt and lime, picked which it is dirt, really, really humble materials, um, can then bring a bit of light into the world. And those kids, hopefully, they will treat the world a bit better as a result of seeing this little chapel. Then their children will treat the world better. So this little spring in Evia, hopefully, will keep flowing for thousands of years. This is outside the um, church, um, just, just a few metres away. So we have worship in church, but then it's a procession that goes outside. So everything spills out and it changes the way you live. And if you've been to a traditional Christian country like Greece or Russia or, or, or Catholic country like Spain or Italy, often you'll see little icons or shrines dotted around the countryside on the roadside. So this shows that everywhere is suitable for prayer. God created the dome of the skies like the dome of a church to show us that everything under that dome makes the whole world a church everywhere suitable for prayer. And it's liturgical art, I think, uh, which is the starting point to help us live like that in the world. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today and hope you've um, uh, found some insight. And pray for me a sinner. Goodbye.